A very good evening aspirants. Welcome to Hindu News Analysis brought to you by Shankar IAS Academy. Today is 31st of March 2022. The list of articles we are going to discuss today is displayed on the screen. First, we will start with this article. In this article, we will discuss about a concept called Vasudeva Kudumbagam. This is a very important concept. You can quote this in your mains answers. We will first discuss about what is Vasudeva Kudumbagam and we will conclude by seeing how India can help the world achieve the target of zero hunger. Then we will discuss about Indian tigers which is very important in prelims point of view. Then we will discuss about this article from text and context page. Here we will discuss about a boundary dispute between Assam and Meghalaya and then we will see about space debris. See this year space debris has been consistently in use. and then we will conclude our session by solving some of the preliminary questions so without wasting much time let's start our discussion take a look at this editorial this editorial talks about a concept called vasudeva kudumbagam see as you know global hunger is on the rise and it is mainly driven by factors like the climate crisis the covid-19 pandemic shocks conflicts poverty and inequality millions of people are living in hunger and many more do not have access to adequate food and the fact is that more people are living in hunger today than in 2015 when the member states of the united nations including india agreed to the sustainable development goals we know that sustainable development goal provided a shared road map for peace and prosperity for people and the planet in the present and future In 2019, 650 million people around the world suffered from chronic hunger, which is 43 million more than in 2014. And since the onset of the pandemic, the number of people on the brink of starvation has doubled from 135 million people to 270 million people in one year. So here this editorial article talks about how India moved from chronic food shortage to surplus producer partnering the world food program it is done by using a concept called vasudeva kudumbagam let us look about them in detail before that the syllabus relevant to this article is highlighted here for your reference you can go through it see firstly what is this vasudeva kudumbagam see vasudeva kudumbagam can be translated as earth is one family from india's traditional philosophical outlook see this concept has gained enormous relevance over the past 75 years since the united nations general assembly emphasized on the collective nature of the crisis and the need for a matching response most importantly at the core of the concept is vasudha vasudha means the planet earth and it describes how different nations from one collective and are unable to escape the shared bond of compassion and humanity see in 2014 unga address our prime minister stated that the traditional outlook of india sees the world as one family and that is linked to its vedic tradition of vasudeva kudumbagam this not only emphasized the importance of this concept for global peace cooperation and environmental protection but also for humanitarian response including rising global hunger and leaving no one behind see india have not only talked about this but proved this concept in many instances for this you can take the example of india's recent and ongoing humanitarian food assistance to the people of afghanistan through the united nations food program see 50000 metric tons of food assistance in the form of wheat is being sent in installments to afghanistan through pakistan with the assistance of world food program in afghanistan the world food program has a large supply chain and logistic infrastructure in place with hundreds of trucks and people ensuring that food aid reaches those who need it the most and no one is left out as a result every contribution and engagement with the indian government saves the lives of children women and men in need This act is not only an example of its commitment but also a commendable step towards humanitarian crisis. It is also important to consider this assistance in the context of the needs in Afghanistan. 
And apart from this, as we know, India has been a strong ally of the Afghan people traditionally. India has sent over a million metric tons of food grains in the past, including 75,000 metric tons last year in partnership with the World Food Program. And in the past two years, India has provided aid to several countries in Africa and the Middle East or West Asia to overcome natural calamities and the COVID-19 pandemic. See here, you might have a doubt. Like how India moved from food deficient country to food sufficient country. In addition to this, it is also extending the assistance to other countries. See, India has made significant progress in food production over the years with the Green Revolution. As you know, Green Revolution marked an exciting journey towards food self-sufficiency. In 2020 alone, India produced over 300 million tons of cereals and has built up a food stock of 100 million tons. The country has registered record harvest over the last few years with several enabling policies and incentives to farmers. And in 2021, India exported a record 20 million tons of rice and wheat. As India's food grain surplus continues to grow, its footprint as a key humanitarian food assistance player is also growing. And according to the author, we had made transition in almost everything like land reforms, public investments, institutional infrastructure, new regulatory systems, public support, and intervention in agricultural markets and prices and agricultural research. And this transition is now offering valuable lessons for other developing countries in Asia, Africa and Latin America. Having seen the transition, now let's briefly see about some of the steps taken by Indian government to ensure equity in food within India. See, one of the India's greatest contributions to equity in food is its National Food Security Act 2013. We know that this act anchors the targeted public distribution system, the midday meals and integrated child development services. Through these schemes, today India's food safety net collectively reached over a billion people. And there is another scheme called Pradhan Mandri Garib Kalyan Anna Yojana. See, this scheme was introduced in 2020 to provide relief to 800 million beneficiaries covered under National Food Security Act from COVID-19 induced economic hardships. This scheme has been extended by another six months up to September 2022. And note that the total outlay for this scheme so far adds up to 2.6 trillion rupees. In addition to this, this editorial also talks about a research conducted by the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, which states that the World Food Program contribute to the creation of peaceful conditions in four areas. What are these areas? The World Food Program strengthens social cohesion. It strengthens the link between citizen and the state and it helps resolving grievances within the communities and between the communities. We know that the Nobel Peace Prize was given to World Food Program in 2020. This cited the World Food Program's role and the importance of access to food in maintaining peace. India has made major progress in addressing hunger and malnutrition, but still a lot needs to be done. We must continue this path as the pathfinder in access and inclusion through public policies and systems. For over five decades, the World Food Program has been partnering with India and seen its transition from being a recipient to a donor. However, we must take note of the fact that India can do more in achieving the goal of zero hunger and equity globally. By doing so, we can embody the spirit of leave no one behind and Vasudeva Kudumbaka. So that's all regarding this editorial. Now we will do a quick recap. See, Vasudeva Kudumbakam can be translated as Earth is one family from India's traditional philosophical outlook. The core of the concept Vasudeva Kudumbakam is Vasuda, which means the planet Earth and it describes how different nations form one collective and are unable to escape the shared bond of compassion and humanity. And we have discussed about India's recent and ongoing humanitarian food assistance to the people of Afghanistan through United Nations Food Program. 
we have also discussed how india has made significant progress in food production over the years with the green revolution and we have seen how india have transformed from a food deficient country to food sufficient country and we have also discussed about the steps taken by indian government to ensure equity in food within india the two important steps are national food security act and the pradhan mantri garib kalyan anna yojana and finally we have concluded by saying that india can do more in achieving the goal of zero hunger and equity globally so with these key points let's move on to next news article discussion friends look at this news article this news article talks about the massive fire at the sariska tire reserve in rajasthan see the fire is said to be under control but the fire fighting operation would continue with the help of disaster relief personnel and eco development committees until the situation was fully brought under control This is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, we will learn about Indian tigers, its distribution and the conservation status. See, this is a very much important topic for your prelims, so please pay attention to the discussion. Now let's start our discussion. See, first of all, we need to know that there were eight subspecies of tiger that existed in the past, out of which three have gone extinct for many years. First we will know about those three extinct subspecies they are bali tiger javan tiger and caspian tiger see you need not remember every scientific names just know the common names now we will see the five surviving subspecies of tiger they are indian tiger which is otherwise known as royal bengal tiger and indo chinese tiger siberian tiger sumatran tiger and the south china tiger Kindly note that the recent reports indicate that this South China tiger is also extinct in the wild. See, now our discussion will be mainly on the Indian tiger. Friends, the Indian tiger or the Royal Bengal tiger is the largest member of the cat family Felidae. This magnificent tiger, which is Panthera tigris, is a striped animal. That is, it has a thick yellow coat of fur with dark stripes. It has black ears each with a winking white spot on the back. It has a powerful fore paws and a long banded tail and it weighs anywhere between 135 to 280 kg. Note that the average life span of a tiger in the wild is about 14 to 16 years. The Royal Bengal tiger is a combination of grace, strength, agility and enormous power and all these characteristics had earned the tiger its pride of place as the national animal of india see the indian tiger is found throughout the country except in the northwestern region also note that it is found in our neighboring countries like nepal bhutan and bangladesh the diet of the indian tiger mainly consists of large wild ungulates such as chital sambar barasinga nilgai and the gar See, our Indian tiger is an opportunistic feeder and can even kill large prey such as elephant cows. See, the tigers are found in a variety of habitats including tropical and subtropical forest, evergreen forest, mangrove forest, swamps and grasslands. Now we will see about the numerical estimation process of tigers which is nothing but the tiger census. It is conducted at regular intervals that is once in every 4 years to know the current tiger population and the population trends. See, many different methods are used to estimate the number of tigers. The most commonly used technique in the past was pug mark census technique. In this method, the imprints of the pug mark of the tiger were recorded and used as a basis for identification of individuals. See there is also a method for estimation of lion census. Kindly find that method and post it in the comment section. It will be useful for you as well as for others. And coming back to the tigers, the recent methods used to estimate the number of tigers are camera trapping and DNA fingerprinting. Now we will see about the conservation status of tiger which is very important. See, Indian tiger is an endangered animal as per IUCN. and it is listed in the schedule 1 of wildlife protection act of 1972 this act gives the tiger protection against hunting or poaching and trade for skins bones and body parts any person who commits such an offence is punishable with an imprisonment of 3 to 7 years 
Note that it is also listed in Appendix 1 of CITES, which is the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora. So, it makes international trade in tiger parts illegal. Now, we will do a quick recap. In this discussion, we saw about Indian tigers. Indian tiger or the Royal Bengal tiger is the largest member of the cat family Felidae. Apart from India, it is also found in our neighboring countries like Nepal, Bhutan and Bangladesh. The most commonly used technique was pug mark census technique where the imprints of the pug mark of the tiger were recorded and used as a basis for identification of individuals. And the recent methods used to estimate the number of tigers are camera trapping and DNA fingerprinting. Then we saw about the conservation status of tiger. It is an endangered animal as per IUCN and listed in Schedule 1 of Wildlife Protection Act and it is also listed in Appendix 1 of CITES. So that's all about this news article. Now let's move on to next news article discussion. Look at this text and context article. This article talks about the Assam Meghalaya border dispute. See, day before yesterday, that is on 29th of March, Assam and Meghalaya partially resolved a 50 year old dispute along their 885 km boundary. So this article basically deals with how the dispute started and how the two governments that is Assam and Meghalaya were handling the issue and finally how they arrived at a solution. So in this discussion let us see all these points in detail. Now let's start the discussion. First look at this map. From this map you can see that Assam shares a land border with Arunachal Pradesh, Nagaland, Manipur, Mizoram, Tripura, Meghalaya and West Bengal. Of these bordering states, Assam has border disputes with Arunachal Pradesh, Nagaland, Mizoram and Meghalaya. In this discussion, we will focus exclusively on the Assam-Meghalaya border dispute. See, before going into the Assam-Meghalaya border dispute, first let us see why Assam has border disputes with most of its neighbors. Look at these maps. It shows the evolution of Assam from 1826 to the present. From the maps, we can understand that almost all northeastern states bearing the former princely states of Tripura and Manipur were carved out of Assam in the decades following India's independence in 1947. See, in most cases, cartographers' lines drawn on survey maps did not match with the local people's perception of traditional boundaries. So this resulted in a number of border disputes between Assam and the states that were carved out of it post the independence. Having seen about Assam's border dispute, now let's come to the Assam-Meghalaya dispute to be specific. See, Meghalaya was carved out of Assam as an autonomous state in 1970. And in 1972, Meghalaya became a full-fledged state. Friends, what act enabled the creation of Meghalaya? Do you have any guess? It was based on the Assam Reorganization Act of 1969. See, the issue started when the Meghalaya government refused to accept the Assam Reorganization Act of 1969. But why was Meghalaya upset with the act? Meghalaya was upset because the Assam Reorganization Act of 1961 followed the recommendations of a 1951 committee which defined the border of Meghalaya. On that committee recommendations, areas of the present-day East Jaintia Hills, Riboy and West Kasi Hills of Meghalaya were transferred to the Karbi Anglong, Kamrup, Metro and Kamrup districts of Assam. Meghalaya contested these transfers after statehood claiming that these areas belong to its tribal chieftains. Now how did Assam respond to this? Assam said that the Meghalaya government could neither provide documents or archival materials to prove its claim over these areas. So basically both these states were contesting their claims. This tussle went on for some time. Then after fighting between two states, finally in 2011 the dispute was narrowed down to 12 sectors on the basis of an official claim by Meghalaya. So this is about the Assam-Meghalaya dispute. So far, we have discussed about the basics about the issue. Now, let us see how the issue was handled by the government so far. See, the first serious attempt to solve the issue was made in 1983. In 1983, an official joint committee was formed. The committee suggested that the Survey of India should 
re-delineate the boundary with the cooperation of both the states towards settling the dispute. But this resulted in no follow-up actions. Now coming to 1985. In 1985, both the states, that is Assam and Meghalaya, decided to form an independent panel. But the Meghalaya government rejected the report submitted by the independent panel. Because Meghalaya claimed that the report was pro-Assam. Again in 1991, both states jointly decided to demarcate the boundary with the help of Survey of India. And about 100 kilometers of the border was demarcated by the end of 1991. But again, Meghalaya found the exercise unconstitutional and refused to cooperate. Then in 2011, the Meghalaya Assembly passed a resolution for central intervention and the constitution of a boundary commission. But this time, the Assam Assembly passed a resolution to oppose the move of the Meghalaya Assembly. But now the central government intervened. The center made the two governments appoint nodal officers. The main role of these nodal officers is to discuss the boundary dispute and minimize the points of difference. See, even after all this, in 2019, the Meghalaya government petitioned the Supreme Court to direct the center to settle the dispute. But this petition was dismissed. So, from 1983 to 2019, there was just disagreements between the state and no real progress in solving the dispute was made. The real breakthrough came in 2021. In January 2021, our Home Minister urged all the northeastern states to resolve their boundary disputes by August 15, 2022, when the country celebrates 75 years of independence. So finally, in June 2021, the two states, that is Assam and Meghalaya, decided to resume talks at Chief Minister level. In these meetings, it was decided to adopt a give-and-take policy to settle the disputes once and for all. Of the 12 disputed sectors, 6 less complicated areas such as Tarabari, Gizang, Ahim, Boklapara, Kanapara Pilingata and Ratachara were chosen for resolving in the first place. My friends from the Northeast, please forgive me if any pronunciation of these areas were wrong. Now coming to the discussion. These meetings paved the way for closure of the six disputed sectors on March 29th. Of these 12 disputed areas, six were resolved. According to the partial boundary deal, Assam will get 18.51 square kilometer of the 36.79 square kilometer disputed area, while the Meghalaya will get the remaining 18.28 square kilometer. That's all about this article. Now we will do a quick recap. See, in this article, we have seen about Assam Meghalaya border dispute. We saw that Assam has border disputes with Arunachal Pradesh, Nagaland, Mizoram, and Meghalaya. But Assam shares a land border with Arunachal Pradesh, Nagaland, Manipur, Mizoram, Tripura, Meghalaya, and West Bengal. Then, with the help of the maps, we have seen the evolution of Assam from 1826 to the present. We have seen that Meghalaya was carved out of Assam as an autonomous state in 1970 based on the Assam Reorganization Act of 1969. We have also seen that from 1983 to 2019, no real progress in solving the dispute was made. In January 2021, our Home Minister urged all the Northeastern states to resolve their boundary disputes by August 15, 2022 because the country celebrates 75 years of independence. So finally, in June 2021, the two states, that is Assam and Meghalaya, decided to resume talks at the CM level. And it was decided to adopt a give-and-take policy to settle the disputes once and for all. According to the partial boundary deal, Assam will get 18.5 square kilometer and Meghalaya will get 18.28 square kilometers out of total 36.79 square kilometer disputed area. So this is all about Assam Meghalaya border dispute. Now let's move on to next news article discussion. Look at this news article. This news article is regarding space junks. See, we have covered space junks in the past, but we will be covering today also because the space junks are in use so many times. As you know, space junks are posing increasing threat to Indian assets in space. The Indian Space Research Organization is building up its orbital debris tracking capability by deploying new radars and optical telescopes under the Netra project. Netra project is nothing but the network for space objects tracking and analysis. 
See, under this project, a space debris tracking radar with a range of 1500 km and an optical telescope will be inducted as part of establishing an effective surveillance and tracking network. And the government has given the go-ahead for the deployment of this radar. It will be capable of detecting and tracking objects of size 10 cm and above. Note that it will be indigenously designed and built. So, this is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, let us quickly go through what are space debris. See, as the name implies, debris are nothing but the remains of anything broken down or destroyed. See, generally, space debris encompasses both natural meteoroids and artificial debris. Here, meteoroids are lumps of rock or iron that orbit the sun just as planets, asteroids and comets do. And the artificial debris includes the human-made orbital debris. But the major difference here is that meteoroids are in the orbit around the sun while most artificial debris are in orbit around the earth. That is why the term orbital debris is also used for space debris created by humans. See, orbital debris is any human-made object in orbit around the earth that no longer serves a useful function. Such debris includes non-functional spacecraft, abundant launch vehicle stages, mission-related debris and fragmentation debris. Now see why space debris are a concern here. See, some space junks results from collisions or anti-satellite tests in the orbit. When two satellites collide, they can smash apart into thousands of new pieces, creating a lot of new debris. This is rare, but several countries including the USA, China and India have used missiles to practice blowing up their own satellites. And this creates a thousands of new pieces of dangerous debris. These orbital debris are in different sizes. And note that there are approximately 23,000 pieces of debris larger than a softball orbiting our Earth. And they travel at a speeds up to 17,500 miles per hour. It is fast enough for a relatively small piece of orbital debris to damage a satellite or a spacecraft. And note that even a tiny paint flex can damage a spacecraft when traveling at these velocities. See, here, fleck is nothing but a patch or a dot or a strain of a color. A number of space shuttle windows were replaced because of damage caused by material that was analyzed and shown to be paint flex only. See, in this article, we have seen about space debris which are nothing but the remains of anything that are broken down or destroyed. We have also seen that some space junk also results from collisions or anti-satellite tests in the orbit. That is, when two satellites collide, they can smash apart into thousands of new pieces, creating a lot of new debris. We also saw that even a tiny paint flex can damage a spacecraft when traveling at high velocities. So that's all regarding this news article. With these key learned points, now we will move on to the next part of our news article discussion, which is nothing but the preliminary practice question discussion. Look at the first question. Which of the following states have land border with Arunachal Pradesh? Assam, Manipur, Nagaland and Mizoram. You have to choose the correct answer. See, this is a factual question. If you have any idea about the question or you can make any guess, you can attempt this question. See, note that Arunachal Pradesh shares its land border with only two Indian states. They are Assam and Nagaland. So, our answer here will be option C, 1 and 3 only. Now, look at the second question. Multi-object tracking radar, sometimes seen in news, is with reference to Option A, an orbital debris tracking capability. Option B, radar used in weather forecasting. And Option C, a stealth technology. And Option D, none of the above. C, the multi-object tracking radar is nothing but a radar which is operating from Sriharikota range which can track nearly 10 objects simultaneously in a distance as far as 1000 kilometers in space. This is something unique because the conventional radar spot a single object at a time. So, this is useful in many ways since it can detect 10 objects at a time and in case space debris is approaching an Indian satellite, the path of the satellite can be diverted to avoid collision. 
Apart from this, this multi-orbit tracking radar will track different stages of launch vehicles simultaneously during nominal and non-nominal missions. But the issue here is this radar has limited range. For this reason only, we are now indigenously building the new radars and optical telescope under the Netra project. Okay. So with reference to this question, the correct option will be option A, that is an orbital debris tracking capability. Now look at the third question. It is regarding the Royal Bengal Tiger. Consider the following statements with reference to Royal Bengal Tiger. Statement 1, it is found only in Bengal and it is found only in India. Statement 2, hunting Royal Bengal Tiger can lead to a punishment up to imprisonment of 3 to 7 years. Which of the above statements are correct? See here, the statement 1 is incorrect. Because we have seen that the Royal Bengal Tiger is found throughout the country except in the northwestern region. And it is also found in our neighboring countries like Nepal, Bhutan and Bangladesh. And regarding the statement 2, it is correct. We have seen that according to Wildlife Protection Act of 1972, hunting or poaching Royal Bengal Tiger can lead up to a punishment up to imprisonment of 3 to 7 years. So here our correct answer will be option B, 2 only. The main question is displayed here. You can write your answer and post it in the comment section. If you like the video, hit the like button, post your comments and share the video with your friends. For further updates, kindly subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy YouTube channel. Thanks for watching.